about who I am. Um, so I'm a, I'm a statistician by training, um, a, a huge recurring research team in my, in, in my group at, at Brown, but also just me as a researcher and what I'm doing at Microsoft Research is to take modern computational approaches and develop theory that enable their interpretations to be related back to like classic biology. And so how I got to this position is, is quite interesting and, 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 and is no way on my own. And I kind of want to uh, reiterate that as I kind of talk about my journey. A lot of people in my field like to show this slide, uh, which is the cost of how much it, uh, the price for uh, uh, sequencing a, a genome and how it's kind of declined over the years uh, from the first human genome project in 2001 to where we are now in uh, 2020. Um, and what they like to do is they like to overlay their own personal life events as, kind of, uh, as this decline has kind of happened. Um, I'm a little younger, so I think it's always funny when I do this as well. Um, so when the first uh, project was kind of uh, getting started and off the ground, I was just graduating from sixth grade in, in, in 2003. Um, and as you move along, I graduated high school in, in 2009. Uh, um, I was born and raised in, in California, Orange County. Um, and then I graduated from college where I went to an HBCU, Clark Atlanta University uh, in, in 2013. Uh, I started at Duke right after that, uh, graduated uh, grad school, got married and started a faculty position. I kind of grew up in 2017. Um, and here we are in 2020. Uh, what an insane year, but I, I started a, a new position at MSR and I'm, I'm very, very happy. Um, so a little bit about my, my journey. I'm an HBCU grad. I like to, a lot of people like to say we're HBCU made. I went to Clarkland University where the uh, uh, saying is uh, find a way or make one. And given the climate, I think it's really important to talk about HBCUs. Um, so how I ended up at Clark actually was in 2009 was right around with a, a, a financial crisis happening, probably nowhere near to where we are at this given state right now, but a little bit of a, a time, a little bit of uncertainty where schools in California were really pulling out uh, um, scholarship money and, and, and investing in other places. And so I would, I planned to go to UC Irvine up until uh, I think August of, of 2009, like two weeks before uh, the regular school year started. I got a call from uh, a, a woman, Isabel, uh, uh, Isabel Jenkins at, at Clark Atlanta said that Clark had kind of found donor money very, very last minute. And if I wanted to get on a plane and do a, a last minute orientation at the school, if I would consider it. Um, and my mom put me on a plane so fast that I, I, I <laughs> she sent me over to uh, Atlanta, Georgia really quickly. And I, I, um, I, I got to learn a little about the scholarship. The scholarship was this Provo scholarship where I didn't have to pay for any tuition fees or anything like that. And so I kind of went back home and in two weeks I had started school in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, going to HBCU was something that I didn't know I really needed at the time, but it, I wouldn't be here today without, without Clark. Um, Clark taught me, uh, CU gave me the intangibles, I think, to really be successful in academia, where it really taught me to persist and hustle for things and go after opportunities in a way that um, has really served me well, I think, of, of moving forward. And so, you know, Clark, if I ever wanted to even even have MATLAB on my laptop. I had to like write a proposal and figure out like who the 50 people I need to talk to, to to get their signatures on so that I could be able to get these programs. And so it was, it was really awesome. So when I graduated Clark, I, I started uh, applying for grad schools and it was really important. I think at that uh, at the time is really relevant even now. Um, was a lot of schools tore me down. I was a, a 4.0 graduate student um, and I was valedictorian of my class, uh, but Duke, kind of saw past my application. And so a, a man named Mike West had asked if I had, uh, was be interested in, in coming to do my PhD in statistics. Um, I flew out to, to North Carolina um, and, I, and I got to uh, uh, visit the campus, visit the department. And what I really liked about the department was how well balanced everybody was. And so not only were people really academically driven, but they were uh, um, uh, very well in tune with people's family situations and, and that, that statistics in at grad school was only a small bit about your life and, 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 and everything else was, was much more important. I really, really valued that. And so um, I ended up going, I ended up choosing to go to Duke uh, uh, for graduate school, which was actually one of the best decisions of my life. Um, I was co-advised by someone in statistics and also pharmacology, cancer biology. And so I kind of split my time between um, a SAS department and a wet lab actually and it was like throwing myself into a different uh, uh, culture where I kind of learned a new vernacular um, uh, of molecular biology and what it, uh, and cancer biology more specifically. Um, my advisors were uh, Cheyenne Mukherjee at the top there and Chris Wood at the bottom. Uh, Cheyenne and Chris were really great for me for two different reasons. 
Um, you know, Cheyenne was really good at teaching me about uh, uh, the very fundamental parts about mathematics and, and statistics. And he really uh, pushed me to learn multiple academic languages, uh, which I thought served me really well. So from a technical perspective, Cheyenne was amazing. Uh, Chris was amazing from more tactical perspective. You know, in biology, you have to, there's a lot of um, uh, getting grants and, and salesmanship. And Chris taught me how to how to articulate my dreams and my visions about where I thought the field was going to be 10 years from now to people um, and how to get people to, to kind of believe what, you know, what I was saying and how to put different pieces in motion so that, you know, 10 years from now, I was going to be right there when, when the next big break happened. And so, you know, they taught me two different things. Um, they both treated me like a postdoc, which is really nice. And so people always ask me how I made the jump. Uh, you know, uh, from from being a grad school student straight to being a faculty member, and I think their training of giving being really hands off, but also very you know hands on in different ways was uh, was really really helpful. Uh, the biggest thing that they taught me that I always tell people is they taught me how to have a pseudo network or a network of pseudo co advisors and advisors. So people outside of my institution that uh, I got to meet that that became invested in my career that not, weren't necessarily my advisors, but you know, they, they looked out for me and they, they I kept up with them. And that was really, really helpful. And so I spent a lot of time in places like Columbia, uh, U Chicago and places like that. And I still carry that with me today, where I think my, I consider my network of pseudo advisors being uh, people like Matthew Stevens, Daniela Witten, Barbara Engelhart, um, uh, Sherry Rose and people like that. So it's, it's really nice to kind of have that collective uh, group where people don't necessarily work with me or even collaborate with me, but, but people I can turn to for career advice. Um, you know, technically why I think I became a faculty member was because it, uh, a few reasons. One, um, people at Duke told me I could do it, which was super important to hear. So if you're an advisor or a mentor, you know, that just that vote of confidence is amazing. You know, uh, a woman named Amy Herring, who was at UNC, uh, but is now a professor at Duke, told me when I was a third year heading to my fourth year, that I should apply for faculty positions because she believed I could be one. And so that really gave me a, a, a start in trying to think about it. Um, why I think I was able to get past the review process and then into finally uh, um, interviews was because there were, it, it takes a village, right? And Duke was a place where it really, uh, they really cultivated things. And they did things that um, I still hold near dear to my heart today. Uh, people like Jenny Tung and other people would, uh, I had to give chalk talks, which I never had to give before. And so they would let me come and sit and chalk talks that were happening at Duke and, and watch them. So I could try to see what was going on. And then more importantly, what they would do is like, I remember, I'll remember this for the rest of my life. You know, after they would leave, Jenny would sit down with me and tell me what she liked and didn't like about their presentations. And so just kind of having that culture. So when I went to mine, I was really well prepared. And so I really took a village. It was from people who weren't even in my departments that really helped and gave me a chance. And so, um, you know, a lot of people now are thinking about diversity and 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 taking people from HBCUs and and bringing them to their to their uh, to 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 enrich the the uh, uh, learning experience at their particular universities. What Duke did for me was not just bring me there, but they made sure I was successful. And I and I really really appreciated that that they didn't just want me there, but they wanted to to me to maximize my ceiling. And I and I have always 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 appreciated all of their support um, um, in that. And so you know I, I was I've been at Brown now for for three. This is my fourth year. Um, and it was, it was amazing, uh, you know, he took a chance on this 26 year old and even Brown in the same way that people at, like at Clark and at Duke took chances on me, uh, Brown is the exact same way where it's, it's very flat and they kind of let me come in and, and, and create this vision of what I thought was really interdisciplinary work, uh, 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 hybrid research team. And so, um, you know, my group is a computational group, but we also do a lot of pure math and topology and, and things like that. So we're spanned across. Uh, uh, not only public health, but comp bio, and as well as uh, brain sciences in the Carnegie Institute. Um, it's an amazing place to work. And so I'm really thankful for every opportunity because none of this would really be possible if, if all these other people didn't individually have their hand in my, in my growth along the way. And so I try to do that now. So whoever's listening now, I, I've been really good on emails for the past week and I apologize for that. But if anybody is ever looking for, for advice or mentorship or anything like that, I'm always here to extend my hand um, what I learned at Duke and what I learned at Brown and what I've learned at MSR is knowledge is, is not power, it's just it's information. And it's information that should be disseminated across as many people as possible. And so, you know, if anyone ever needs anything about what I did or mistakes I made along the way, I'm here to always openly share about that stuff. Um, so now for the real cool part where we're here about the science. Um, 
So, so I think about modeling variation across complex traits. And so, you know, that could be anything from human height um, uh, and, and, and more quantitative traits we're going to talk about today. We also might be about, about shapes a little bit. So we're, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm a fake topologist in a way where we, we, we like to model 3D structures. And so you can think about this as uh, heel bones and primates and things like that. But this idea of modeling variation across individuals and across species is, is really like the fundamental part of, of, of my group. And so the data stuff that we're gonna talk about today, um, and I'm gonna stick to really basic quantitative traits because I want this to kind of uh, uh, be relevant for a lot of people. And so we can think about having like a vector of some quantitative trait Y, um, and we have a genotype matrix, uh, like SNPs or genes, in this case, it'll be SNPs. So uh, every cell here is encoded as a zero, one, or two based on minor allele frequency. And we're gonna have a lot more um, SNPs than, than individuals, right? So, you know, going to STAT 101, you know, people typically model this kind of data is with like linear mixed models, right? Linear mixed models like the backbone of like statistical genetics, um, where you have this uh, X matrix, uh, you do this like uh, uh, linear, uh, uh, estimation of, of effects where every beta here models like the additive effects or additive uh, uh, evidence association of how a particular SNP is affecting your phenotype of interest, right? And so that beta term is very, very important because it enables you to really do all your hypothesis testing, derive p-values, and then you can create plots like this, this, um, uh, this Manhattan plot here, right? So where the, uh, the x-axis is chromosomes, you log transfer your p-values, you can identify regions along the genome, right, that are really enriched for a given trait, right? So my group tries to think about this uh, dissection of uh, phenotypic variance past additivity. And what I mean by dissecting phenotypic variance is we can think about uh, the variation of a trait as an like, entire pie, right? So you have an entire pie that's 100%, and we can kind of break down this pie into different components, okay? So uh, this pie is made up of both uh, genetic components, and then there's also an environmental component, right? And my group thinks a lot about this genetic component and how to dissect that into different, different parts, right? And so you can have both an additive piece and as well as a non-linear piece, right? And a lot of times in, in stat gen, genetics at least, we call this non-linear piece epistasis, right? So we're, we're, we're my group and me as a researcher, um, and, and a, a lot of things that we're thinking about uh, now as I, as I move over to, to MSR, is you know trying to model these uh, this entire pie with these like black box statistical methods, but also think about interpretability when we do so, right? And so what I mean by black box is uh, you have some machine learning method that's well suited to sort of, uh, prediction task. Black box just means that I don't really know what's happening in the context of this algorithm. I just know the outputs are really uh, well powered or, or 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 very accurate, right? And so I have some input data that goes into the black box algorithm. I'll spit this really nice prediction but I'm not really sure what's happening on in between. And so my research goal as a researcher is really to provide some like interpretable ways to summarize the, the importance of the inputs and kind of say how the so black box is prioritizing those inputs or upweighting and downweighting them. So I get these really nice outputs, right? And then not in the context of what I typically do, the inputs are just genotypes, right? And the outputs are just phenotypes, okay? Um, and so what's really important about this is, you know, linear models only see a little bit of the picture. Right, so so the, you know you're mapping these additive uh, components really well. You have this environmental component, which you're kind of missing a piece of this heritability, which is this nonlinear piece, right? And the black box models kind of get this entire picture. Now the problem is on the left hand side we have interpretability, but on the right hand side we don't, right? Left hand side we have these effect sizes, hypothesis testing, p values, these kind of things. The right hand side we don't necessarily have that. And so my group kind of thinks about these ways. To, to model, to have models that we, that we deal with on the right-hand side, but bring that interpretability piece to come into it as well. And so we think about the components of an interpretable model as just three basic components, right? You have some motivating probabilistic model. Uh, I'm gonna channel uh, Daniela Witten's uh, uh, Twitter rant that I, that, I, that I did very near and dear to my heart, which is just a middle linear model, right? So we're gonna, we have some motivating probabilistic piece here. Um, every interval model has some notion of an effect size or regression coefficient, okay? And then the third thing that makes a model interval is you have some kind of statistical metric that summarizes whether a marker or a gene or a SNP is important or not, right? And so my presentation outline is going to be broken down into two, uh, two components, okay? The first one is going to be based on these like post hoc approaches uh, for interval machine learning, right? 
Um, and the second one's going to be where we think about now is like a, a more of how would I, how do I let annotations in the literature kind of govern what I think is interpretability and how I impose that interpretability onto my black box models in order to, to model things that are more context specific. Um, and so typically what, what I work with are, are non-linear regression models. Okay. So instead of this restrictive X beta relationship, like you saw in a linear model case, I have this F of X term which is a, a, a nonlinear transformation of my data. We think about, um, I went to Duke, so I'm not, I'm not Coltley Bayesian, but I was trained as a Bayesian. We think about this as like, a, we could put a prior on this function space and we think about this like a GP or something. This GP is just as nonlinear, you can think about this, this wavy function, um, all kind of governed by this covariance function K, right? And so K kind of is a nonlinear measure, if you think about it as it summarizes the nonlinear uh, uh, similarities between an individual's uh, genotypes against someone else's genotypes, right? So K1, X1, and X2, here just measuring how similar um, uh, sample one is it from sample two, okay? Now this is really nice because with these models we get really nice predictions, right? So we have this thing called the kernel trick where I have this high dimensional data set. I, I, I throw all my data into this, this kernel machine um, and I do really nice predictions on, my, on this right hand side. Now the issue is in genetics and biology, you actually really care about, well, which SNPs are most important that's contributing in this nonlinear fashion to my Y, right? And so the idea of coming back to my original input space, that's, there's, there, you know, there's not a lot of intuitive ways to maybe do this. And so uh, the downside is that when we do these kernel tricks, uh, the, the classic idea of variable selection in statistics is lost, right? So I spent a lot of my PhD thinking about this, this question and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of my uh, students at Brown also think about this now as well, um, which is uh, how to maybe think about, um, how to maybe have an, a notion of an effect size or regression coefficient in my model, okay? Um, and so this is the idea of the effect size analog, okay? So on the right, I'm gonna on the left, I'll tell you about linear regression, which is something that we're all very, probably really aware of. I have a regular linear regression model. My effect size in a linear regression is just the, uh, me projecting my, my phenotype Y onto the column, space, the column space of my data, right? And we could choose these projection operators to be whatever case we want. Um, I'm gonna say this is a standard operator, which is like a generalized uh, uh, inverse, where beta hat is now like a linear, uh, a least squares estimate of, 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 the, um, of beta, right? Now the effect size analog kind of is the same thing, except now I'm gonna fit my nonlinear Gaussian process model. I have an estimate of my function F. And the effect size analog, instead of projecting Y into the column space of X, I'm just gonna project F onto the column space of X. And it kind of gives me an idea of, of um, from after learning this like nonlinear smooth function, how each beta or how each input variable was contributing uh, 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 to that estimation, right? Same thing, I could choose these different projection operators. What's really cool in statistics now is a lot of people are thinking about different projection operators that work really well. And this talk will just use the standard linear one, but you can think about different uh, uh, values here or, or different uh, uh, functions uh, that could go there at the bottom. And so the beta tildes are really nice because I can actually do prediction and, and variable selection with those in the same way that I would think about doing them classically in, with linear, linear models. And so uh, let's say I have some, uh, some, some model at the top here. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be Bayesian here, so we're gonna do some like MCMC where I'm gonna try to sample F via this algorithm. What's really nice there is at the bottom, every time I learn a new estimate of my function F, I have a new, uh, I have a deterministic step where I also implicitly get a, uh, a draw from the posterior or the implied posterior for beta tilde, right? So I also have uncertainty about beta tilde. I can have a posterior mean for beta tilde and I can start doing inference of beta tilde, okay? Now the, the, the issue with the procedures that, that I've done thus far um, or that we were doing thus far in my PhD was, you know, beta tilde is just a weight. Right, so it doesn't really tell you significance, right? So going back to my, my interval model uh, checkoff list, I get a notion of effect size and regression coefficient, but I don't necessarily get uh, uh, significance out of it, okay? So when I, when I uh, uh, came to Brown, I started thinking about these ideas of, well, how do I get a statistical metric that maybe summarizes uh, significance without maybe necessarily uh, automatically getting like a p-value 
for posterior inclusion probability, right? And so uh, we came with this, this, what I think is an intuitive way of maybe doing variable selection of any model that gives you some um, uncertainty over your predictions, okay? Um, and I, I think about this via sports, okay? So instead of genes, let's think about a basketball team, right? Any basketball team that you wanna think about, okay? Now with that team, I have some kind of information that's built after I kind of understand and know this team, right? We have some like posterior distribution about the effects and how well they, they work together like a network effectively, right? Now let's say that I take anyone on this team, let's say I take number 30 there in the top left corner and I put him on injury reserve, okay? Now without him on the team, I now I'm gonna figure out like how, how many games or, or how much information is lost or how about the identity of this network with number 30 out from playing, right? It may not be that much, right? We still, I still may know 99% of the information about the team. Let's say I take another random person, any random person, and that person wants to go play baseball or shoot Space Jam or something, right? So then they're off the team, right? Now, how much information is lost when this random person is not playing, right? And so the, the difference between the full conditional distribution, the full, the full distribution, the conditional distribution of that person not being around is going to tell me how much information that person might make up, okay? Now, we can quantify this uh, via this thing we call uh, uh, KL divergence, okay? And so uh, just to kind of go through the math a little bit, um, basically, we're going to summarize how much a given variant or variable is on the rest of the on the rest of the data right by measuring the difference between the conditional distribution with that uh with that marker's effect being set to zero and then uh the the mark the the the, dis the distribution of the full of data with that effect being marginalized out right so it's like i have information in, involved in this distribution this one the effect just been set to zero if the KO between those two distributions is zero, then that can be interpreted as, as that given SNP or that given variant is not really explanatory um, or is not a key explanatory variable relative to the others, right? I don't really lose a lot with that variable or that player not really being around, right? Alternatively, you can say that KLD is zero if and only if those two distributions are the same, right? Now we came with this idea of the rate measure, which is basically telling you how, how relatively central these things are, right? Right. So like a relative centrality measure. So all we do is we take the KL divergences of all my SNPs in my data, right? I do this for every SNP. I scale them by the sum of them. And so now we have this idea of uh, all the SNPs kind of scale to one. We have this idea of relative centrality. And what I kind of like about this rate measure, it kind of gives me an idea of a of null distribution. So what, what rate null hypothesis is, is that everyone on the team is contributing to our success, but no one is contributing more than others, right? So it's like we're all bench players. And the alternative is that you have some stars, right? So some people are actually contributing to the, to the success of the team or, or the information of the network more so than other people, right? And so let me kind of show you how, so that gives us this like one over P. One over P is telling me that if everybody's rate measure is around one over P, then we're all about the same, right? That's like our null distribution. Let me kind of show you how this works in a very quick uh, simulation study. Um, so let's say I have a data set. I'm going to have 25 markers. I'm going to choose three of them to be uh, the only causal markers. You can think about that as Jordan, Pippen, and Robin. Okay. Uh, we're going to, although other players are, are not going to be involved. And, and what I want to show is that this rate measure should be able to identify Jordan, Pippen, and Robin, and not the other ones. But I also want to show what happens if I remove um, information about um, my stars iteratively, okay? So here's what you get if I just run the full data on its own. Um, so as you see, we, we identify Jordan, Pippen, and Raman across these, these, uh, these settings. Everyone else is set to zero. Now let's say I take Jordan and I also sit him out with other players. So now I wanna see, okay, without Jordan being around, what happens to the importance of everyone else in the data set? What's really, what you see is that we still have Jordan or, or Pippen and Rodman still being the most important players. But now what you've seen is the, the relative importance of the other bench players kind of have gone up uniformly, right? You could think about that as saying, um, you know, I've lost 45 points per game. So those 45 points would be made up somewhere, right? And so because everyone else is about equal, their relative centrality kind of goes up about the same, but almost like in a uniform type manner, right? And we can do this again where I take out now Pippin, so Robin is the only person left. 
and then take our ROM and then kind of see we're just left with like kind of all bench click, right? And this idea of like they're kind of surrounded in null. Now, what happens if I had simulated data without any causal variables at all? Well, you can kind of see everyone kind of hovers around this line, right? Now, I'm saying this is like the most, the best way to do a, a variable selection with, with nonlinear models, but it is a nice kind of intuitive way where you're thinking about centrality and, and variable selection and relative importance, right? Um, and what's really nice about this, you can do this with any model that gives you some kind of uncertainty over your predictions, right? Uh, so let me kind of show you how this works in real data. Um, here I have uh, data from the Welcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. Um, it's going to be a small GWAS data set. We're going to have 2,000 mice, um, 10,000 SNPs. The original data set is really nice, actually. It has 129 uh, traits in it uh, via like six broad groups. Um, what's really nice about each of these traits is they're, they're, the, the section of their genetic architectures are all different. And so I'm going to show you a little bit. Some of these have additive effects. Some of these have pairwise effects. Some of these have third order effects. And so it's really nice to kind of have this diverse data set across all these traits. I'm going to show you uh, just uh, HDL for the for the time being. Um, and the baseline we're going to look at is um, just a single step GWAS type test. Okay. And so on the top, we have the rate measure across, again, this is a Manhattan plot. We have all the chromosomes for the mice. You have the rate measure on the, the x-axis, or sorry, on the y-axis. And uh, compared on the bottom is a single SNP like linear regression. And you can kind of see where the signal is super, super strong um uh for chromosome one there's a lot of concordance there um and then there's a lot of concordance a little bit on chromosome 11 and then on these other areas things kind of uh, fall apart what's nice about these stars is these are regions that have been validated from other studies so the things that we found other people didn't find uh, that that the single SNP model is going to miss what's interesting is about the these uh, some of these stars actually contribute to broad sense architecture so architecture past additivity so people have seen uh epistatic interactions kind of happen here and so if you kind of go back to, again, kind of promoting why it is important to kind of think about these nonlinear type models, you know, these are all the traits, all 129 different traits. These are their broad sense, uh, their, their genetic architecture is broken down from additive, pairwise, third order effects, and how much of the phenotypic variance each of these components contribute across all these traits. And you can see the additivity, the purple at the top, doesn't always dominate the phenotypic variance uh, explained for a given trait, right? There are a lot of times where pairwise order is, is a dominant effect. Uh, third order interactions are, are play a huge role. And so it is interesting, it is important to kind of think about process, past these like broad, uh, these just narrow sense type uh, traits, if we can. And so that's what we've been doing from a post hoc perspective. Um, and I think there's a lot, like I said, I think there's a lot of work to be done here. There are, there are a lot of people in statistics thinking about this in different various ways, as well as in just machine learning literature uh, in, in general, um, variable importance, more targeted type predictions and things like that. So that's, that's also really cool. Um, but one thing I've been thinking about really recently is how to do, you know, these type of variable selection type measures uh, with just, you know, neural networks. So if I didn't want to do a post hoc measure, but I just wanted to fit a model and pull out a posterior inclusion probability like I do in Bayesian statistics or derive a p-value like I do in, in just regular linear mixed models from, from uh, in a frequentist type manner, you know, how do we type of do that? And, and more so than that, how do I also have interpretability after I, I uh, acquire these statistics, right? So what are these, what are these summary statistics even mean? And so um, I've been thinking about, again, this is going back to this idea of, of everything's kind of just, it's just a linear, it's another linear model, right? So I've been thinking about probabilistic neural networks is just nonlinear generalized or generalized nonlinear models effectively, right? And so you can, you, you put a probability distribution on the weights of your, met, uh, of your model, you can kind of write this as like a hierarchical model, right? So F is the thing that you're trying to, is your, is your like, you know, prediction, uh, you know, if you transform F in some nonlinear way, uh, uh, via like a, a uh, logistic function or something, you can think about case control studies. Let's just assume for the case being that I might have a quantitative trait. So sigma is just the identity function. Um, you could think about, you know, you're putting your model, your input data into your network. These datas are, are a linear combination of X and these datas kind of contribute to what you're seeing in these hidden activations, these, these H's, right? After you have this nonlinear activation, if you kind of know, you know, H uh, cutting out to your 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 prediction is just another linear combination of these new sets of weights, 
right? And so if you put priors on these things, you can kind of learn the posterior distribution of these weights and you can do, you know, just like you do anywhere else. If I put a, if I put a sparse prior on these Ws, I can do variable selection on these Ws the same way I do it on any other kind of model, right? And so I've been thinking about this of like, is there a way to potentially do this uh, in GWAS, right? In a way that we can actually, you know, not only just look at these Ws, and, and, and these datas, but also get an interpretation out of them, right? So there's a really nice thing, uh, uh, observation here for uh, enrichment studies, where there's kind of like a hierarchical nature to, to GWAS. So you have these SNPs, right? But every SNP is like encoded for in a given region that could be uh, 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 corresponding to a given gene. And those genes are, are collection of genes are in a given pathway. And so for each SNP here, we kind of know it, what, what region these SNPs kind of correspond to, right? So these SNPs in this region correspond to uh, uh, this, this gene on the left-hand side of chromosome one. You know, these genes over here correspond to, to ATP uh, AP4 uh, on, on chromosome 15. And so we kind of have this nice like gr natural grouping along the genome. Um, another way to think about this is you know, I have, I kind of have a predefined gene or pathway annotation list, right? Where for every gene, I know where every gene is. I know the chromosome that gene is on. And I know the start and end positions for that. So I also know what SNPs kind of group naturally within that given window, right? And so on the, on the right-hand side, we have another uh, 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 Manhattan plot where you can kind of see that groupings kind of paired along where every gene is kind of listed and every, every uh, spike of those SNPs correspond to that given red dot. Right now, bear with me. If you just look at that a little bit, and I kind of like flip it on its axis, so let's just take this and I flip it over. Those groupings kind of give you almost like a natural sparse neural network, right? Where if my inputs were SNPs, then every hidden layer, if it's partially connected, where I say I kind of govern those partial connections, where I say only those partial connections for SNP that correspond to a given gene or SNP set in my thing are connected in the next layer. I now have interpretations where my input layer are SNPs. My hidden layer now, each node in my hidden layer represents a gene or a SNP set. And then I have my phenotype at the end, right? And if I want to take it one step further, I could say genes are now contributing or, or being uh, annotated for different pathways. And then I have my phenotype. But I now have a nice like hierarchical grouping along the thing. And so now I have interpretation all the way through the model, right? And so what's really nice is now I can just treat this as like one nice hierarchical nonlinear model, right? So this is what bands are, the biologically annotated neural networks that are governed by annotations in the literature. So uh, I have a bunch of SNP sets in A, where I know SNP set one is on some type of chromosome. I know the start and end position for that chromosome or for that on that chromosome position. And I know what SNPs fall within that region. And then I have that just correspond to my neural network, right? So I group all the different uh, blue circles together, depending on what green circle they correspond to in my SNP setlets, and then I have my phenotype. And then what I do is I put prior distributions, and I can kind of govern this by putting special type prior distributions on each of these ways, depending on how I think SNP effects are distributed, how I think uh, SNP set effects are distributed, and how I think everything kind of contributes to the overall variation of my trait Y. Right, and so this gives me like a multi-scale inference type framework to kind of uh, infer and, and, and investigate genetic architecture. Um, so what's really nice is at the end of this, uh, oh, so not only can we do this with uh, uh, individual statistics, so um, individual level data is just assuming that I have access to individuals' genotypes and as well their phenotypes. In GWAS sometimes we don't, we're not always, uh, um, privy to that information. So sometimes you have to use summary statistics. And so this also works with summary statistics as well, which is also really nice. Um, and so what you should get out of this is, like I said before, simultaneous uh, inference on, on both SNPs and SNP sets as high as you want to go, right? And so uh, in, in, the, in the paper that was that are listed at the bottom of these, of these slides, we, we use uh, a, a variational EM algorithm to do so. Uh, something that I took from Matthew Stevens' group at U Chicago and kind of altered it for the purpose of 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 our uh, our neural network case. 
a posterior mean for any weight of a non-zero SNP or SNP set is going to be set to zero at the end of this algorithm. And then we're going to get these really nice, like I said before, I need some kind of significance measure. We get posterior inclusion probabilities for enriched SNPs or, or for associated SNPs, but also for enriched SNP sets, right? And so I can figure out, okay, which SNPs are contributing to my trait, but also which genes or pathways are also contributing to my trait. And I'll get that all the information all at once. So let me kind of show you how this works in, in practice compared to other um, methods. And so here we're going to take chromosome one from the UK biobank of people of, Euro of individuals of European ancestry. Um, we are going to uh, identify genes on chromosome one uh, based on using uh, the RefSeq database. Um, just for the sake of this, I'm just assume we have a, a moderately high broad sense heritability. Um, in the paper, we have a, a ton of different scenarios that you can uh, go and check out. Um, but the idea here in this model is that if, if BANS is doing what it's supposed to, then it should be competitive against fine mapping methods as well as aggregated SNP set methods, right? So, so gene level methods as well as uh, uh, SNP level methods. And so what we see across a, a, a range of architectures in this paper, that's actually what's happening. Um, so on the right, left-hand side, you have a sparse architecture, which just means that there are only a few SNPs contributing to the trait. On the right, you have polygenic architecture, there are many SNPs contributing to the, uh, to the trait. Um, the right is much harder, obviously, because you know, if I have, going back to my pie example, if I have many slices that are, that are contributing to the pie, you know, only a few means that each SNP is going to get a large effect size. And so it's going to be easier to identify causal SNPs on the left. Where in the polygenic trait, I have, you know, a ton of small little slices for each SNP. And so identifying any given little effect size that's very, very close to zero is going to be much, much harder. It's going to be harder to distinguish true causals versus false positives effectively. But you can see even in this high and moderate case that we do, that we do quite well. And actually this trend uh, carries out throughout all these different scenarios that we consider in the paper. Um, but what's really nice is that, you know, we can also think about identifying genes as well. And so uh, we, you know, we take the, the, the posterior inclusion, inclusion probabilities from the second layer, and then we, we rank those and we see that we can identify the genes that are, that are corresponding to those, uh, to those given SNPs also really well. And so here across all these different types of groups, we, uh, we do quite well. Um, our, our gold standard here was Matthew Stevens RSS because that's like the gold standard in the field. And, and so uh, what's nice is that we actually, or chronology sometime can get up to two, two times faster than this method. And then we seem to outdo it in a lot of different scenarios. And so that's really nice because I, I respect his, his stuff so much. Um, one thing that I, that I wanted to pose to this group because in case people are thinking about these kind of questions is this idea of estimating heritability within neural networks. And so, you know, BANS does quite a nice job in certain in sparse architectures, but variational inference sometimes can underestimate the weights of these effects. So sometimes we don't estimate heritability as precisely as we would want to. And so there are some rooms for, there are a ton of room for improvement that we kind of go throughout in this paper that we really tried, that I, that I wanted to pose to the field to see if people wanted to, to, uh, to not only uh, advance, but also, you know, help us think about in collaboration as well. Um, so as a final thing in, in the, and I'll talk about our last stuff that we have going on moving forward. Uh, we have, we did this replication study with the UK Biobank and the Framingham Heart Study, which is actually really cool. So uh, in the, in the Framingham Heart Study, we have six, uh, about 7,000 individuals, about 400,000 SNPs. We took uh, 10,000 randomly uh, sampled individuals of European ancestry from the UK Biobank. And then what we did is we filtered down genome-wide to just uh, the same corresponding 394,000 SNPs that we use in the, in the framework and heart study. So different set, totally different sets of individuals, same SNPs. Um, and then we considered the same uh, 18,000 SNPs set across them. And then we, we ran them on different traits to see if we were able to replicate, you know, one finding in one cohort versus another finding in another cohort. That's actually what we were able to do, which is actually kind of cool. So on the top, you have Framing the Framingham Heart Study. Um, in the legend, you have different genes that correspond to the different colors. Uh, the, the, the dashed line is what we call the median probability model. It's like the model for uh, you know, Bayesian variable selection, where you say everything above this line is something that I would call statistically significant if I was to talk to an experimentalist. Um, and then again, we have 
uh, chromosomal position on the on the x-axis, and then our posterior inclusion probabilities range from zero to one on the y-axis. The stars at the bottom for the UK Biobank are actually the exact same SNPs that replicate across those two groups. And so, what we see across actually multiple of these different phenotypes that we try is that we actually get a really nice high replication rate, which is kind of really nice to to see that we can take our model and run in different ways, and we're gonna we're gonna come up with the same. Uh, uh, trend inside of those uh, solutions and conclusions. Um, so that's really nice. Um, and so I, I encourage everyone to kind of read this paper and, and definitely, uh, you know, uh, email me, tweet at me, whatever the case might be. I would love to like talk about this and, and, and have some future collaborations moving, uh, moving forward. And so I kind of want to spend like the last uh, 10 minutes or so talking about ongoing work that we have in the group and so and, and, and ongoing work that I'm pursuing as a researcher at, at, at MSR. Um, so like, like I said, I'm, I'm on this, I'm on this kind of mission uh, to, to kind of generalize all of these like neural network type methods uh, and all these linear mixed model methods to, to and finding analogies that we have in, in neural network space and machine learning type space. And so um, one, one huge thing that we are that we're thinking about now is how to extend these type of band frameworks to think about genomic studies with small sample sizes. That's a, that's a huge part of like my my personal uh, future stuff moving forward. Um, but also how to extend the band framework to model multi omic type data simultaneously. Um, there's a lot of efforts that we have of ongoing collaborations with people at the Broad Institute and MIT that we're thinking about these kind of questions now. Um, a, a, a secret passion of mine, like I said before, is, is studying uh, shapes. And so we're thinking about how to do machine learning analyses using shape summary statistics. And so um, one huge question that I've always had and that I, that I really pursue moving forward is how to probe whether shape variation is somehow correlated with genotypic or phenotypic variation. So that, that moving image that you see at the bottom there, that's, an actual, that's a brain tumor or, or a mesh of a brain tumor where we took slices of an individual from the TCGA uh, where we have uh, uh, MRI scans we segment that tumor. We segment that tumor, and we we throw it in a convolutional neural, ne neural network. And we're able to kind of reconstruct the mesh from which this tumor kind of uh, almost like I had gone to your brain and like kind of pulled the tumor out with my hand, right? And so what we want to do is we want to link the variation across uh, 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 tumor meshes um, to oncogenic activity. So like, you know, as a way of saying, can I actually study the variation across morphology as a proxy for what's happening on the genotypic and phenotypic level? Okay, so almost like doing variable selection, but with three dimensional meshes instead of just like, uh, instead of the, you know, the typical uh, quantitative data type trait, right? And so that's, this is a, a huge part of my future plans is, is this pipeline called, called Sinatra. Uh, Sinatra stands for something, but it, it's just a really cool name as well. Um, so Sinatra is a pipeline for how to do variable selection with three dimensional objects. There's no secret that doing this with brain tumors is very hard. So we started with something much simpler, which is like teeth from primates, bones from primates. Um, so here we have uh, an input, uh, we, we input 3D meshes into the, to the uh, software. Uh, so you have species from species one, data from species two. What, this, what our model does is it takes these meshes and it runs these sweeps over them where we compute what we call topological summary statistics. Here we use Euler characteristics where we count the vertices, edges, and faces along this mesh um, and begin a direction. And we rotate that and we, and we collect these curves. And so we see at the bottom there are panel B or us kind of collecting these curves that kind of, uh, as a kind of uh, filter across this mesh. Those curves represent topological and geometric information about that three-dimensional structure. And so what we do with these curves is we use those as like proxy information for what's happening on three-dimensional space and we do variable selection on them. So I try to identify the pieces of the curves that are most variable from species one versus species two. So that's what you see in this red from, from panel C. And then what we do because our, in our, our uh, transformation from mesh to topological summary statistic is invertible, we take those red regions and we project them back onto the actual shape themselves. So in panel D, I can actually visualize the three-dimensional structures that are actually different across those two groups. Right, and so we did this with a ton of things. You can actually see different areas where you can identify uh, features of a tooth that marks a, a plant eater versus something that marks a, a bone, uh, a bug eater. It's actually like it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. So that's what we're trying to do moving forward: is trying to move, take this 
type of uh, method and use it now for more uh, medical applications, protein type applications. And this is something that we're uh, pursuing now at, at MSR that could be very cool, I think. Um, and so with that, I, I really want to thank everyone for taking their time um, on this uh, uh, Thursday to, 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 to chat and listen to me about stuff. I, there are a ton of people to, to thank uh, both at Brown and abroad, um, uh, Imperial College in London, uh, Zhang at, at University of Michigan, uh, people I've been really grateful of giving my group and other people in our uh, in, in Brown um, money. <laughs> um, uh, for those who are, I want to do a quick shameless plug, for those who are thinking about uh, opportunities moving forward, uh, two things. Um, Brown is an incredible place. I think that uh, what Comp Bio is going on at Brown is really special, led by Sahini Ramachandran, who's an insanely effective leader. I think what she's doing with Comp Bio in that space is going to be um, incredible. Uh, so people who are thinking about graduate school, uh, postdocs, that kind of thing, that's, that is a group to really keep an eye on. Um, and then for my own selfish reasons, uh, at, at, at my new role at MSR, you know, there are internships and postdocs and things like that. And I, and I have to say, there's no better time to be doing comp bio at Microsoft Research. And so please look out for those opportunities. Please reach out for those opportunities. Um, uh, uh, Nicola Fuzzi is is doing something special uh, in that space, and so uh, there is uh, a, a lot of cool things to be had had there. So uh, uh, please, I want to I want to continue to be an ally for this network for as long as possible. So please don't hesitate to to reach out. Um, so 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 with that, I just want to say uh, thank you. There are some uh, resources, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, super awesome and really intriguing story. I think definitely I learned some things, even though this isn't my immediate field. Um, but thank you so much. Um, if any, anyone has questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or um, we still have some time. So um, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask them. Hi, Janae. Uh, this is Nyasha. I have a question. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I was, I was muted. Oh. me. Hi, Lauren. Thank you so much for a very cool talk and all the great work you're doing. So I, I have a couple of questions, but I'll just mm -hmm. ask one and give other people a chance. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I like there's a couple of really interesting technical details in some of the models. So mm -hmm. I was interested in the replication of the mm -hmm. UK Biobank SNPs in the Framingham Heart Study. Mm -hmm. um, did did you find I find it quite surprising that so many replicated? So the mm -hmm. Framingham you know, Heart Study mostly contains African Americans. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And then the UK Biobank is specifically excluded. Um, non-Europeans in your analyses and as you're building that initial model. So how do you account for that? Validity? I don't want to, I don't want to give too much away. So, um, because it's something that we're, that we're really working on now. Um, th that's, that's a great point. And, and one thing that I really want to, uh, that I've, that I've been, it's been itching at me for a while is this idea of replication, right? So in genetics, we're always like, things replicate if we identify the exact same SNPs. And you're absolutely right. When we think about things, people of different ancestry, you have to think about different LD maps and things like that, right? Um, and so what I think about replication, like if we're thinking about replication genomics, is if you replicate um, the same uh, uh, functional type hit, right? Like, so if, but I might not find the same SNPs, right? Because our LD maps are totally different. If I identify the, the uh, the exact same um, uh, maybe gene, for instance, right? Or signaling pathway, right? So things that are functionally happening at the same level. Um, no, that's a, that's a really great point. So here we did some, we just did a naive run, right? So we just took, um, and, and not everything replicates exactly the same. So what you'll see across, so we, we actually published the entire, uh, or we, we put out on Bar Archive, all the inclusion probabilities for all genes and all SNPs that were used in that, in that data. Um, what you'll see is there actually is quite a bit of a difference, but the the, the strong signal there actually is a, a large hit. I didn't go too far into the uh, the ancestry differences there or anything like that because we wanted to keep it just about the the method per se. Um, but I do think moving forward, 
when we think about replication, we should think about that definition a little bit just as a field. Um, one thing that I think is, is also really important is this idea of that we're also working on, and so is a big uh, uh, leader, I think, in this with other people like Alicia Martin and other people, um, is trying to get larger biobank sized publicly available data sets of multi-ethnic individuals, right? So we can start to really understand that architecture a little bit better. And so, um, um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you in terms of like the technical details of that, but we, we really just took the data as is. We tried, we did the same exact cleaning procedure for the mm -hmm. UK biobank that we did for the other ones. And all we made sure was that we had the exact same SNPs that we had for the Framingham Heart Study. As we ran it. So we ran the Framingham Heart Study one. So when you read the paper, what you'll see is the Framingham Heart Study happens first, and then the mm -hmm. replication study happens after that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, of course. Okay, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I'm going to start with David's question. Um, David and Noma, would you like me to ask the question or would you like to ask it yourself? Oh, you could go ahead and ask Jen. Okay, okay well, I, I, I could ask well, since I'm talking already. So Crawford, thank you for your presentation. Wonderful one. So I think I was just going through because I'm also in that area because I'm mm -hmm. starting my I'm starting my graduate studies and I'm also going thinking of moving in that line. So I just wanted to ask for the simulation in the multiple scenario, at what um, tool you used? Because I've been checking out some, uh, I just, since you said you simulated on multiple scenarios, so I just wanted to know. What yeah, yeah. So, used, yeah. so on, so on the, uh, I, we have a, we have a pipeline that I've used for a very long time. Um, on that, on both of those links at the bottom here, on both those GitHubs, you'll see our, our, our pipelines of things. How things typically work is I take, we, we, we typically take um, real genotypes and we create synthetic phenotypes where the architecture of those phenotypes are toggled by a few parameters, right? So we'll, we'll set up easy scenarios where we think about highly heritable traits that are only driven by additivity, right? Those are like the simplest cases. And then I'll have something a little bit more complicated where we'll do maybe polygenic. So instead of maybe 100 SNPs contributing to the phenotype, maybe we'll have 1,000 instead, right? So the effect size mm -hmm. of every single causal SNP gets really, really small, and it's harder and harder to identify those things. So that'll create my, my hard versus easy case for the plots I just showed you. Then we'll create harder scenarios where we'll say, okay, some of those trips, some of those SNPs are all additive, but some of them are also contributing to maybe co uh, complex uh, uh, epistatic interactions, so just like pairwise interactions. So that'll create another scenario. And then we'll throw some like population structure on top of it. And it'll all be controlled by these little parameters that we toggle back and forth and that creates our entire like 60 page supplementary at the end of the day, okay. right? Like yeah, that's I'm like, sure. that's like how we uh, go through and we just like systematically run through all these different scenarios. Okay, but you have them deposited in the repository. We, we have the, we have the yeah. basic code deposited. We can't give the, the okay, real the full... genotypes, but we have the, pi we have okay. the pipeline there. Pipeline. Okay, I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have our next question coming from Greg Carter. Would you like to ask your question? Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm at the Jackson Lab and I was wondering about uh, the multi-elements analysis you mentioned. Um, seems like that would be a, a really powerful biological annotation to add to the neural net analysis. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm wondering if if you're drawing from data on same cohorts or you're drawing on public data or you're just drawing from existing annotation level data sorry interesting. yeah there this it's a it's a yes yeah, so this is this is a this is a really cool direction and something i think that is very very wide open so there are multiple ways to take this the reason i think we why the g the gwas case is so easy is because filter or combining things from snips to genes to pathways kind of follows in this nice hierarchical lineage or sometimes if you have multi-omic multi type data, it's hard to think about how this, how they should hierarchically maybe play with each other. Um, and then also you have these different meta-analysis things. So the, the, this question is very much wide open. Um, it's something that we're trying to pursue now. Um, so right now we're starting with it, data coming from like the same like cell line, for instance, or the same individual. We haven't thought about how to try to you know, mix things in yet. Um, one place we're also moving forward um, is is thinking about like time series type data, longitudinal type studies as well um, in that space. 
but if you're if you want to work on if you're thinking if you want to uh spitball ideas i'm more i had the time <laughs> anytime you want to chat all right great yeah maybe i'll yeah. shoot you an email yeah yeah okay so i'm gonna do um guillaume's question um just because there are lots of people wondering about your um, biologically annotated neural network guillaume would you like to ask that question sure um yeah so i have the uh, my, my question is do do the the groups of uh snips in your biologically annotated neural networks have mm -hmm. to be of the same size no no they don't okay no 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 not at all so yeah it could be they, it could be two two snips for one gene and yes ten so we so we in the in the in the um in the paper we filtered snips we filter genes that just had one SNP. So we consider both genes, gene annotations, and then we consider these like intergenic type regions. So regions between genes that were kind of like SNPs are kind of left in this like gene desert that weren't necessarily annotated for things. We did exclude genes that had just one SNP included um, just because there was just like a, uh, we, we, it's hardly, I, I, the 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 motivation for that was just that you know we didn't just want like one connection there we wanted to have at least two connections uh for a given node if it was just one gene annotated for one snip then we just dropped that gene basically and and put that snip in an intergenic region um that happened very few times but we just uh, decided to do those but they can all be of different sizes um and actually what we see is that uh we don't have a bias in those sizes so that was that was really nice to see. Um, we didn't consider pathways though, and so one thing to think about is that you know SNP is only oh, SNP is only going to be in like one gene in our case. Um, we didn't consider the, the pathway case where multiple genes or a gene can be annotated for multiple pathways at a time, right? So you have like uh, we didn't we didn't think about we didn't go that far ahead in the in our annotations. So that's that's one thing that could be a little different if you move one step higher. Still, that's great though. Thank you. Not bad. Yeah. Okay. So um, in the interest of time, we can just go ahead and wrap this up. If you have any more questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Dr. Crawford. I put into the chat um, the link to RSVP for the next installment of the series, which is a a workshop about um, using a tool called OncoMX um, for both COVID-19 and cancer data. But I just wanted to thank everyone for being here today and everyone's support. Um, this was really awesome and successful and um, just so happy that um, we could come together today. So any other questions, um, I'll be here to um, answer. Um, but thanks again, everyone, for being here. Thanks, awesome. guys. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Crawford. Thanks, Janae. Bye. And I'll be reaching out to you because um, what you are doing is very synergistic with what we are doing in Oncomix. So really cool stuff. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye.